Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to worship and I'd like to welcome me back from vacation. So I'm uh, thankful to see you here this morning, but I'm very thankful to be in worship with you back. Um, it's good to be back, in, you know, from vacation and everything. It's good to take those, but I do enjoy being back with you and seeing you all. So I'm thankful to be back, and I'd like to thank you for allowing me to take it. Um, me and Kayla had a great time. It was too short, but we're back. And so we're uh, engulfed in everyday life once again. But more importantly, we're engulfed in worship, which is where you need to be. You need to be with like-minded people who are faith and order. So we're here to worship the Lord, and I pray that's why you're here this morning, to lift the Lord in, in worship and in prayer. And so that's what we plan to do this morning. So once again, thankful to see you all. Um, we have quite a few announcements, but uh, I guess we'll wait till later to handle those. If you would go ahead, please stand, and we'll go ahead and prepare to take up our morning offering. Let's look to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful once again for the opportunity to gather in your house this morning, Father. We pray, Lord, that everything we do here, the songs we sing, the message we bring in here, Father, we pray that everything is honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we are able to come to you through prayer this morning, Father. It's because of his sacrifice on the cross that we have a relationship with you and that we're able to enter the gates of heaven when we depart from this world. Lord, thank you so much for the grace that you've bestowed upon each and every one of us. Father, we pray for the one who may be here who doesn't know you as Savior. We pray, Lord, that they would turn their life over to you before it is everlasting too late. Father, forgive us of our sin and forgive us where we fail you. Lord, be with this offering we take up and allow it to be used to glorify you, but also, Lord, to make your message known throughout the rest of the world. Lord, thank you so much for your grace, for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This morning, we'll be finishing up our Pursuing Discipleship series. And for those of you that came in the sanctuary after Sunday school, I put a handout back there that you'd have all the verses that we're going to be talking about. There's a fill in the blank if you want it. You can send your child to go get it, or you can go back and get it, or you can pick one out, out after you leave, however you want to do it. But it is back there. Um, because we're not going to be necessarily in one chapter or one book. We'll be in a few. For example, we'll be in Luke. And we'll be in Titus, so if you want to go ahead and be making your way there, we'll be in Luke chapter 10 and Titus chapter 2, uh, namely, but we're going to be talking this morning about the idea of pursuing discipleship. We've been talking about that for uh, about four weeks now, and this would be the third week. Um, I'm thankful for Toby for filling in last week, and he preached on Jesus. Uh, it's kind of fitting. I didn't ask him to, but he did that anyway. So I appreciate him filling in. So we're going to be talking this morning about a disciple-making church. A man once asked a theologian, why did Jesus choose Judas Iscariot to be his disciple? And that's one of the mind-boggling questions that we don't understand. If Jesus, being all-knowing, who is completely in line with the Father, he is completely in line, he's led by the Holy Spirit, guided with the knowledge of God, knowing that Judas Iscariot was going to betray him, turn his back on him, turn him into the authorities that would ultimately lead to his death, why would you choose Judas to be a disciple? That's a question that kids ask, that adults ask, that everyone here probably has wondered as you read through the Bible. Why did Jesus ask Judas? And the theologian answered with an insightful reply. He said, I do not know, but I have an even harder question. Why did Jesus choose me? That's a much harder question. We don't know why Jesus chose Judas, but I don't know why Jesus chose me. I don't know what was going through Jesus' mind or Judas's mind or Judas's heart when Jesus called him. I don't know what Judas uh, had in mind when Jesus was teaching him and walking through life with him. I don't know what he was thought, but I know what I thought when I sinned. And I know how I went through my rebellion against my Savior. And so I know what I thought. And so it, it is even harder of a question to ask, why did Jesus choose me? I don't know, but he did. And he's chosen me, he's chosen you, not because of how great we are, but because of his love for us. And so as we think about calling those disciples, you know, remember the, a couple weeks ago Jesus was talking about, come follow me, be a fisher of men. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he issued that command, follow me. It was a statement, but it was more of a request. He wasn't going to drag Peter, James, and John and make them his disciples, but he was asking them to be his disciples. He was requesting them to follow him. And Jesus did the same thing for us. He was walking by our sin, uh, the sea of our sin, our hopelessness, our despair, and out of that, he called us from that. But he didn't leave us with that. He didn't say, be my disciple, and then he ascended back up on high and just leave us. He didn't do that. Instead, he gave us a few helpers. The first one comes from Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church that day. That's a major help. 
I don't know if the early disciples had the Holy Spirit. It doesn't look like they did because it looks like later on they received the Holy Spirit at the same time the church did. At least it looks that way. I don't know. But he has poured his Holy Spirit out, so whoever calls upon him has an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit leads us, guides us, tells us what's wrong and what's right. That's a major help to have. You're, we call it a conscience or an internal co uh, compass. It's the Holy Spirit if you're a child of God. And so we have that. And so we have uh, that trying to help us and trying to lead us and, and guide us in, in the way we are to go. But we also have something else. We have a community of faith and like-minded believers. And we call that the church. And here's a few. Uh, it's listed on that handout if you have one. If, if not, it'll be listed on there if you get, if you get one. But he's given this faith-like community these verses that we call the Great Commission. And it's in all five books of the New Testament, the first five books. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Most of you would have quoted that with me. You've learned that from Sunday school. You've learned that. You know that probably by heart. And if I asked you to quote it, most of you probably could. I'm sure Ashlyn and, and uh, Caleb could too. I'm sure they've learned it. But Mark says the same thing. He says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. See a pattern yet? Hopefully you did. I gave us, I gave us five examples. In John chapter 20, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then I woke up this morning about 6.30, and this was the verse of the day. I thought it was very fitting. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so five times, we talked about repetition in Sunday school, five times in different gospels and history, if you include Acts, Jesus issues a command to his church. I will call it a church at this point. To his early followers who are going to go on to establish the church to grow and to multiply, he said five times, you are to be a witness for me. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 28, what does he say? Go ye therefore, preach the gospel, teach them. You know what that means? Make a disciple of them. And so go and make disciples. So the church has this command that is to go and make disciples. Right? We understand that. We know that. That is our overarching goal. The church is to go and make disciples. But now, how do we do that? Because it's a whole lot harder. It's, it's very easy for me to say, parents, you are to raise your children. Right? But how do you do that? Right? When the diaper's dirty, what do you do? When the, when the kid's throwing up, what do you do? I don't know. Just raise your children. It's easy to say that we know what to do, we need to do it, but it's a whole lot harder to say, well, how do we do that? What are the steps? What does it look like? How do we know if we're actually making disciples? And this morning, I think there's three things a disciple-making church does. So the first thing, a disciple-making church trains disciples to love. In Luke chapter 10, look to, uh, with me, if you would, to verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Now it's an interesting little uh, thing when you start looking at this passage and researching this passage. What actually looks like is the Jews reckoned every Jew 
had a place in heaven. And so this lawyer is not asking, how do I get there? The lawyer is saying, how can I make sure that I can guarantee that I am a part of the community that's going to heaven? Not how do I get there, but how do I know that I am in that community going there? It's an interesting little concept. That idea of lawyer isn't necessarily someone that testifies. It's just someone that knows the law very well. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, how do I guarantee that I'm going to have eternal life? How do I know I'm going to be in eternity? And so Jesus asks him, he says, you're a lawyer. What does the law say? And so he responds in verse 27. The lawyer responds. And he says something from Deuteronomy and from something in Leviticus. He says, you shall love the Lord your God. Interestingly enough, we go back. It's not necessarily with. It's from. And so you should love the Lord your God from all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And so he quotes, I believe that's Deuteronomy, he quotes this and he says, I should love God from all of my heart, every part of my heart, I should love God from all of my heart, and with, so my love comes from my heart, but I love God with all of my soul, all of my strength, and all of my mind. So your heart, that refers to your inner person, right? You don't love your kids with the organ. You love your kids with, with you, with your inner person. You love them to the depths of your being, right? That's kind of a, a phrase that we say. You love them with your inner person. So all of our love comes from our inner person. It's an interesting concept. And so from our inner person, we should love the Lord our God. But then with, he says, first off, your soul. That correlates to your life, to what it refers to, your life. The soul is what we see kind of breathed into people. When uh, Eutychus, because that was a family feud question, when Eutychus fell out of the window in Acts, Paul says it's okay, he's alive. He referred to his soul. And so this idea is love your God with your soul is with your life, with the, the ounce of your being, with your, the ounce of your life, the, the thing that keeps you alive. It's an interesting little concept. Then he says your strength. You should love God with your soul and with your strength, that is your might, that is your, your power. You're to love God with every ounce of your might, every ounce of your, your power. And then he says you love God with all of your mind. That obviously means our understanding or our intelligence. So basically every different part of us, our mind, our strength, our life, our, our being, should be angled and looking, displaying our love for God. He says this is the basically first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your strength, and all your soul. And then the, the lawyer added on something. So yes, we are to love God, but second, we are also to love others. He says in the latter part of verse 27, that you should also love your neighbor as yourself. In kindergarten, in first grade, what are you taught? That golden rule. Treat other people how you want to be treated. In their time and, uh, time and day, time and age, they would divide people into different categories. And so if you didn't fall into one of these categories, you were not their neighbor. And so that would include the, the Gentiles, that would include the Samaritans, that would include, uh, include the half-breeds, whoever they, they deemed, you're not in the category, you're not a Pharisee, you're not a Sadducee, we don't have to love you. You're not originally of the house of Israel, we don't have to love you, you're not our neighbor. And so the lawyer tries to basically justify himself. And he says, well, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus begins telling this, par this parable. For time's sake, we won't read it all and get into it. But he tells us this parable, the Good Samaritan, where the man is walking and he falls uh, among some robbers. They just rob him. They leave, leave him for dead. And so as he's laying there dying and, and hopeless and helpless, a priest walks by. He doesn't see him, or he, he sees him. He doesn't want to walk past him, so he kind of goes around the other way. A Levite, who is a, someone who works in a temple, not a priest, but someone who works alongside the priest, sees him, goes the other way. A Samaritan sees him, someone who's not considered their neighbor, someone who's not supposed to help them, is walking along, sees him, helps him, gets into town, pays for the hotel bill, says, take care of him till I can come back, and I'll pay you whatever. And Jesus asks the question, he says, in the story, who is the man's neighbor? Well, it wasn't the priest who was holy and righteous who walked around. It wasn't the, 
temple worker who was holy and righteous who walked around. It was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Go and do likewise. And so he sends the lawyer off. He says, you are to go and you are to love God and you are to love everybody. You see, what Jesus did using that parable is he demolished that boundary between neighbors. He says, y'all don't like the Samaritans, y'all don't treat them as equals, and yet that's your neighbor too. You don't like the Gentiles, you're not a fond of them, those are your neighbors too. And that correlates to the church. Every ounce of our being should love the Lord our God. I pray here today that you love the Lord your God. Not through the motions, love, but that with all your heart, with every ounce of your being, you love the Lord. Think of a mother's love for a child. You love that baby. You love that child with every ounce of your being. Uh, it, it used to be, you know, I might die for my husband. I will die for my child, right? I am willing to die for my child. I hope you have that same burning love, that passion for the Lord, because that's what we should have, because it started with him loving us. And so in return, we too should love him. But then second, we are to love other people. The idea of loving your neighbor. That means the, the scary people that you run into. That means the people who live next to you, but also in other states. Everyone we run into contact with becomes our neighbor. And so as a church that's trying to make disciples, what we should be doing is training our members and our kids to love God. And above everything, I hope they leave here loving God. I pray that's everything we teach them is to love the Lord your God. But the second most important thing is that we teach them to love their neighbor. Whether that be the crazy aunt on your mom's side, or whether that's the crazy uncle on your dad's side, or whether it's some crazy neighbor that you have, I pray they love him. I pray they use respect and reverence and clear-mindedness around him, but I pray they love him. Why? Because we have to understand God loves them more than we do. And that's what we have to look through sometimes. We have to look through God's eyes at everyone around us. Yes, they may be crazy. And you might have those loved ones who you just kind of tolerate. And we all know who we're talking about. If you don't have one, you're the one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we just tolerate you. Huh? But through the eyes of God, God loves that individual. How much? So much that he died on the cross for them too. And sometimes we're like the Pharisees, and we divide each other, and we say, I'll tolerate you, I really enjoy you, I like you, we'll hang out together, but I'll just tolerate you. And God says, I love them enough that I die for them. The church needs to respond the same way. When someone comes into our doors or we run into someone at Walmart, we love them with the same love that God has. We love them with the same passion, not necessarily the same level, because we can never love to that level but we stop shunning everybody and we say, you are a creation of God in his image and he pot you with the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you too. So the first thing a disciple-making church is to do is to love and is to train disciples to love. Now go with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We'll start in verse 11 through 15 and then back up. The second thing, a disciple-making church trains disciples to live. Verse 11, Titus chapter 2. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And so Paul's writing this, uh, this letter to Titus. He's just like Timothy. He's a young elder, a young pastor in the church. And so he writes and he says there are a few things that you need to be doing and teaching within the church. This isn't a side conversation. He says this, this is what you need to teach to your church. This is what you need to teach to your congregation. He says in first, uh, verse 12, he says teaching, that, uh, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live 
soberly. soberly. The second thing the church is to do, if we are to make disciples, is that we are to train them to live. He talks in uh, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, he brings up their past. He says, you were dead in sins, you were dead in trespasses, you were basically a rebel, you were an enemy of the Lord. But when you came to Jesus, something within you changed. He says to the Corinthians, uh, I think it's chapter 5 in the second Corinthians, he says that you are a new creature. You're a new creation. That old man, he's gone. He's passed away. He's no longer here. The new man. And so put on that new man. And so there is a, there's a, a different, differentiation when you come to Jesus, or there should be. Think about baptism. We'll use that as, as an example. When you become baptized, what you were doing is you were declaring to the world, I am identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you tell the world, I identify with the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to be very careful on how you live. Why? Because now everything you do immediately reflects your Savior. And so you have to live a very certain way. And so Paul says uh, to Titus, he says, you need to teach the church, you need to teach that you are to deny ungodliness. The nature of humankind is not godliness. We learned that very early in the Bible back in Genesis chapter 3. They completely rebelled against the Lord. God said, don't do this, and that is precisely what they did. And ever since then, we have steadily been going astray to the will of God. Think about your own life. Has there ever been a time where you completely submitted yourself to the leadership of the Lord? I can think, if you want to be honest, no. Because it's not in our nature. It's not in our nature to, to choose godliness over ungodliness. It's actually contrary to that, right? It's a lot harder to choose godliness. It's much easier to choose ungodliness because it pleases the flesh. And so you have a battle for your mind, for your heart, for your time, for your resources between ungodliness and godliness. And you know why it's a battle? Because it's not natural. It doesn't come natural. And so Paul tells Titus, you need to teach them to deny that. Teach them to have this self-control. Teach them that they are to deny, to remove from their life this ungodliness. Everything that's contrary to the Bible needs to be removed. He says also in verse 12, worldly lust. Don't also deny the ungodliness, those things that are directly uh, uh, con uh, contradicting what God has said, but also those things that please you, the worldly lusts that you have, those things that catch your eye or, or draw you closer. He says you have to deny that. You need to teach the church to deny that. Because why? Well, they're living in a pagan society who don't necessarily believe in the Lord, who may believe in whatever other God or don't believe in any God. And so for you to be a shining light for me, to be a witness, you have to live differently than everyone around you. You can't get caught up in the ungodliness and the worldly lust around you. You have to be different in order to be my disciple. And so instead, he says, in verse 12, we should live soberly. The idea of soberly, you think about it in uh, reference to alcohol. If you are sober, you don't have it in your system. It's not controlling you or messing with your mind. If you are a sober-minded thinker, you're very clear-headed. You can think properly. You can think clearly. You can make rash decisions because you're thinking properly. But if you have any other thing clouding your judgment, you're no longer clear-headed. You're no longer thinking soberly. And so the idea from verse 12 is that we should live soberly. We should live in such a way that the only thing controlling us, guiding us, is the Holy Spirit, is the Word of God. We should not live in such a way that everything should be crowding our judgment and making harder on us to live our life. Be living soberly, not under the influence of anything but the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we are to live righteously. Now, let's understand this, even at the Lord's Supper tonight. We are not righteous people, okay? We are not righteous by any means, any stretch of the imagination. We're not righteous. But we can take the Lord's Supper tonight righteously, not because we're righteous, but because it's been accounted to us as righteousness through the blood of Jesus. And so it's not because we are so holy and we are so amazing that our lives are righteous. It's because we have come under the grace of Jesus and to God we have been counted as righteousness just like Abraham. And so we can live righteously, not sinlessly, but righteously because we are living in direct, uh, uh, in obedience to what the Lord has commanded us to live as. And so we are to walk and live righteously. And thirdly, in verse 12, that we are to also live 
godly. We are to display everything we do should basically be a, a relation back to the Lord. It should uh, show that we are the Lord's people, that we are to live godly in the present age. Now, they were living back in different times than we are. They were living under pagan societies. They had different rules for the men and for the women, and we'll see that here in just a second. But we're living in much different times, right? We have a lot of stuff going on, social media. That wasn't around. The Internet wasn't around. Even dial-up wasn't around. You know, they didn't, they didn't pick up their smartphones and call anybody. They just had the, the cans with the string. They, they, they didn't have any of that. They, they were living in different times. Paul did not say for us to live in their time, did he? He said, don't walk righteously in their time. Walk righteous in your time, in the present time in which you live. It may be different fights, but it's the same idea. Amen. Live righteously according to the Bible. Walk in godliness. Walk soberly so that you can be a witness for me in your present age. I think a lot of the things, we, we want to live in, in older times, and rightfully so, right? Back when you could climb a tree. Um, I think Kayla told me this morning, or something on Facebook, that someone got uh, arrested or charged for spanking their child with a wooden spoon. All of you going to jail? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's what the weapon of choice was, right? Just a different time. But the church was not called to live in 40 years ago, 50, 70. The church was called to live today. And in order for us to be witnesses today, the church has to live in today. And we do. Most of you have smartphones. Most of you have a Facebook page. Most of you are living in your current time. Our church also has to be living in the current time. The church has to be relevant. If not, we're going to be irre uh, irrelevant. And why would anyone listen to us if we are irre irrelevant? I'll say it in a second if it's proper. The church has to be relevant in the time in which it lives if it's going to ever be effective in the place in which it's located. We have to be relevant, and so we have to be living this way presently. Not only on Sunday or Wednesday, every day. Wherever you are in the present, you are to live as a Christian, walking godless, godly, walking uh, righteously, walking soberly in the present where we are, not just one day, every single day. When you are in the view of a lost individual or someone who you don't know, we are to live righteously. The idea of the pastor is you have to live righteously. I have to live a certain way. We call it the fishbowl effect, right? Fish bowls, before they got so fancy with the tanks and the aerators and all that, used to just be a clear bowl. Think about Sesame Street and Elmo, just this clear bowl, and you can see Dorothy, wherever the camera was, Dorothy was invisible, or in, invisibility. You could see her, okay? That little goldfish. You could see Dorothy. That's kind of the same idea that pastors have. You talk to preachers, and we talk about the fish bowl effect where everyone is looking at us. Right? You're expected to live differently. You're expected to talk differently. You're not expected to listen to any music, be on Facebook. You kind of think if you just live in a monastery, you're just kind of removed from the world. Well, the Christian really has that same effect. There are, everyone, there are people around you who may not be believers or believers of a different faith, and they're looking to you, and they're seeing you. Nothing is hidden from an unbeliever. Nothing's hidden on your Facebook post. Nothing is, is hidden in your life. People can see. And so it's important for us while people are looking at us, which is constantly, that we live the way that the church should be training us to live. That is righteously, soberly, and godly. And then the third thing, um, a disciple-making church, is to train disciples to lead. Look back with me, if you would, to uh, verse 1 of Titus chapter 2. Once again, Paul is writing to Titus, and he says, here's what you need to do, Titus, in verse 1. As for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, there's two ideas that we need to start talking about in order to lead effectively. The first way that we should be leading is that we should lead other people to Jesus. Above all, we should be leading other people to Jesus. And I want to uh, encourage you, if you don't have a handout, if you uh, didn't pick one up, I encourage you to pick one up as you leave here. Why? Because every church member should know how to lead someone to Jesus. 
And so on that page, they have fill in the blanks. They have spots for you to fill in the blanks. I did not put any fill in the blanks on this section because I don't want you to have to guess what you have to do when you lead someone to Christ. It's all laid out there for you. And here's the steps. The first one, you need to realize your need for a Savior. That comes from Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All, have come, uh, all fallen short of the glory of God. The first thing a sinner has to do in order to be led to Jesus, you have to realize your need for a Savior. You have to understand that you have fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe not in you know, comparison to your family or in comparison to your friends, but when you compare yourself to the bar, which is Jesus Christ, we have all fallen short of that glory. And so you have to first realize that your need for a Savior. The second thing you have to do is realize your consequence of your sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. As kids get older and older, and especially teenagers and young adults, what do they want to do? They want to make money. Devin is considering right now working through the family vacation so he can make money. I'd rather go to the beach, but whatever, man. That's fine. That's the idea of a wage, right? If you do something, you get paid for it. You go to jobs, so you work eight hours, you get paid for it. That's your wage. The idea comes in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin. So your payment for sin is death. So you have to realize that that's a reality, but because of your sin, because of your lies that you've told, because of the way you've gone astray to the Lord, you have a consequence for your sin, and that consequence is death, and we're like, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it's not just physical death, right? It's not just going into a casket and going into the ground. It's spiritual death, being removed for eternity from the God who loves you and being cast into the lake of fire. There's a real consequence to your sin. And so third, you have to realize that Jesus died for your sin. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Realize that you were still under that consequence of sin, and while you were there, Jesus was elsewhere dying in your place for your sin. And so he, God was demonstrating his love toward us that while Jesus was dying, we were sinners, God was making a way for us to achieve salvation. Fourthly, which comes from Romans chapter 10, you have to confess your sin and believe Jesus died for you. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what you have to do is you have to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. You have to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And then in verse 13, you have to call on the name of the Lord. Verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, why do we go through that? Most of us have been saved. Most of us know we've, we've walked down this with, with a parent, with a deacon, with a preacher. We, we know because it's important for you as a church member to be able to lead someone to Jesus. And you need to know from the Bible, please don't try to lead someone because you've been taught this. Go to the scriptures. Show them why they need a Savior. Show them the consequence of their sin, but show them the glory and the grace of God that was presented to us through Jesus Christ and show them how. A lot of what people do is they call me. And I understand that, right? The first time you ever lead someone to Christ, it's a scary thing because literally eternity hangs in the balance. That's a scary thing. But the more you learn these verses and the more you begin trying to lead others to Christ, you'll become more comfortable with it. And when you teach a Sunday school class or a VBS class, or you're a church cabin uh, counselor, you can take what you know and you are able to lead other people to Jesus. It's important. Not only one person in this, in this church needs to know how to lead someone to Christ. We all need to know. And the church should be training us how we lead other people to Jesus. Because ultimately, whether you join the church, whether you get baptized, none of that matters if you never place your faith and trust in Jesus. And so we should be leading and training our disciples to lead other people to Jesus. And the secondly comes from Titus in chapter 2, and we get into it. Titus begins uh, receiving these instructions, and he, basically he starts being trained on how to lead people in the church. He says, in, beginning in verse 2, he says, The older men should be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. Basically, he starts talking about the 
older men. Now, in their day, they would divide people older or younger. And are y'all ready for this? It's about age 40. <laughs> Most of y'all, oh, because I was young. That was, that's how they described you. So you were either older or you were younger. If you were 40 you were, and, and up, you were about older. Everything else was younger. And so Paul says to these older, these older men, he says, Titus, train the older men. These, these men over 40, those old guys. You're not old until you go to church camp. Then you're old, but other than that, you're not old. Train them first to be sober. Train them to be, it says in verse 2, reverent. Train them to be temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. He starts talking about how the older men should be demonstrating these things, how they should be sober. Well, it goes back to the idea of clear-minded, thinking clearly, thinking properly, not being under the influence of anything, but being sober, being clear-minded, being able to make a decision. Number two, he says in verse 2, is reverent. Interestingly enough, it carries the idea that your actions lead to your respect. It's not just that we respect you because we have to, because you're our elder. It's that your behavior and your actions demand respect because you carry yourself in such a way that it is, by default, people respect you. They respect you. They count you reverent. They, they hold you in high esteem. But it's not just in the church. The idea of this idea of reverence goes back to everyone outside the church as well, that the older men carry themselves, that they're sober, but they are do these actions that cause people, regardless, to respect them. Third thing is temperate. Basically, you exercise sound judgment in every aspect of your life. You're sound in faith. You're, uh, in, you're uh, sober in love and patience. And so you're, you hold to the Bible, not the traditions of men. You hold to the Bible, what the Bible says. You hold that in, in high regard. You hold that in, in respect. Um, you love, you, you're patient. And so then he goes to the, the older women in verse 3. He says, The older women likewise, that they also be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And so he says to the women, roughly over 40, and he says that they are to be reverent in their behavior as well. That the way they conduct themselves, the way that they behave, the way that they talk and walk, it should be respectful and it should be in such a way that, that everyone around them should respect them. That it, their actions, their behavior just demand that respect. And notice what it says in verse 3. There's two things that Paul says don't let them do, or to make that differentiation. First off, they're not to be slanderers. That means gossip. Don't be talking behind people's back or, or biting them in the back or stabbing them in the back. Don't be gossiping about them. Be factual. Because basically there's the idea of the pagans that they would do, they would gossip and talk about everyone, they would judge, they pass judgment. He says, don't let the older women do that. Be different than the pagans. Live this different life within the church. And he says in verse 3, not given to much wine. The idea is basically not addicted to it, not allowing it to drive you and to, to deem you. He talks to Timothy in a letter, I think from prison, and he says to take a little wine for your stomach. Wine back in their day was fine for, for use medicinally or for other uses. So however you want to take that, that's, how, that's what it means. But don't, not given to much wine, not addicted to it, not craving it, needing to have it, letting it uh, control you. And then in verse 3, look what it says. Teachers of good things. So that, in verse 4, they admonish the young women. And so he goes on and he says these women should carry themselves in such a way that they are actually teaching the younger women, not necessarily by sitting them in a classroom and lecturing them on how to be women, but their actions train the other women on how to behave and conduct themselves. Basically, we don't realize it a lot, but the way you conduct yourself, someone's watching you, whether it be little Caleb who's, who's watching a, a guy do something around the church. I mean, dad's an electrician, so there's that. Or, or whether it be a little girl trying to be like our Sunday school teacher. We see all these, so Paul says... These older women, these older men should be conducting themselves so that the younger ones are being trained to do the same thing and carry their, their, their selves the same way. And says in verse 4, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And so he says these, these older women should be training these younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be pure, 
to be homemakers now, back, once again, back in their day. Paul's not saying anything controversial. Back in their day, the house was the woman's domain. That's what she did. That's what she run. And so in their day, Paul says, when you're in the home, you're doing the best you can. You're doing a good job. You are loving your husband. You're loving your children. You're being obedient to their own husbands. And then he says on the, the back of verse 5, he says that the word of God may not be blasphemed. We talk about in marriages, and when you perform a marriage, you may you know, find this out from your studies. But we are to follow what the Lord has kind of put in place. Some marriages, the woman runs the house and the man just submits. That's not the way God intended it to be. And I'll be bold and say that that's not the way God intended it to be. God did not intend for the woman to run everything. God intended for the man to be the leader of the house. And when he talks about the pastor, he says the pastor, the man who, who fulfills that, that position, has to be the leader of his household, having all his children in subjection. Why? Because it's a direct relation to the church. The idea was never to put man on a pedestal and let him drive the woman. That was never the goal. It was to be a leader as Jesus is to the church and in the Old Testament how Jesus led Israel. It was this idea that the wife in her role would submit herself, herself to the godly leadership. That's the key. Godly leadership of her husband. If the husband's not leading God, God Lee, if, he's not, if his leadership is not godly, I don't think the wife should submit. That's not biblical. The wife should be leading godly, trying to do everything the Lord has asked him to be, to be a father, to be a provider, to be a leader. Then the wife needs to submit herself to the husband. Why? Because God has ordained that this is the way that it's made. I'm not saying we're not equal, because we are equal, but we have different positions and different roles. And so Paul says the, the, the women need to be obedient to their husbands. Why? Because the husbands should be leading godly. They should be leading the way that God has intended them to lead. I want to encourage you, if your husband is leading the way that he needs to be leading according to the Bible, submit. You can throw in your opinion. That's fine. You, you should. Me and Kayla have, have had this discussion before. I'm not going to just rule. We're going to have a conversation. But ultimately, I am in place to be the leader of the household. And we, ha we have that understanding. I'm not going to dominate her. I'm going to love her and cherish her. But we have those roles. I can, I, she's my equal. Maybe not in height, but she's my equal. But we are to be respectful. And I'm just to treat her with what? Love, cherish, buy her whatever she wants for her birthday. But God has ordained these positions. And so it says older, older women train these younger women in the same way that they are to do the same thing you're doing, that they are to be living their life in the same manner that the Bible says that you should have lived. And then he goes right on. He doesn't leave the young men out. He actually gives them a whole lot longer thing. He says, verse 6, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, that means clear thinking, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. He says, Titus, you're a young man. You need to be an example to the young men. You need to show yourself to be a pattern of good works. You need to, in doctrine, show integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility. You can question my motives. You can question me uh, doctrinally. I think I have it okay. I think I'm solid. And if I'm not, challenge me. I want to be solid. Because Titus was told that he needs to be doctrinally integ er, integrity. He needs to have doctrinal integrity. He needs to be reverent and he needs to be incorruptible. I want to be the same way. And so he says in, in, in all these things, showing to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, in verse 8, sound speech that cannot be condemned. The young men have, first off, when he goes back to verse 6, sober-minded, that needs to be number one, I think, for a reason. Because young men can be clouded by every ounce of anything imaginable. Anger, emotion, and everything can construe them. And so the first thing the younger men should be is sober-minded. Don't let anything influence you or control you. Be sober-minded. And then he says, be sound in speech. It doesn't just say, you know, think your speech sound. He says, actually... Have this speech sound that cannot be condemned. 
He says, basically, think of yourself in a law in a, in a courtroom and everything you say under scrutiny. He says, never let anything you say be condemned or be held against you. And actually do it in such a point in verse 8, that the latter part, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. Be so thoughtful in your speech and in your word choice that no one can hold anything against you. Now, why is it important that we train the younger generation to do, to do the same thing? Because it gets harder and harder and harder the further you go. We don't have older and younger now, right? We have uh, all kinds of generations, and I'm not even going to start naming because I'll miss some. You know what a generational church actually glorifies the Lord? It does. A multi-generational church glorifies the Lord. Why? Because you have two, four, six, eight different generations getting along. That's not normal. Most people want to be around people who are like-minded, like faith. But when we come together, we have older people, we have younger people, we have kids, we have mothers, we have grandmothers, great-grandmothers. We have these people who are from different generations getting along. That's not normal. Because when you go visit your grandparents, what happened? Well, back in my day, and the world was better back... But when we enter these gates, what happens? We join together not because we like our generation the best. It's because we love our God the best. And so we'll jo join together in fellowship, and we will glorify God because we are able to get along. But it's also important for the health of the church. And here's why we've been doing this series, and here we'll kind of draw to the conclusion. Because I think in our churches, not just Missionary Baptists, but I think most of our churches in general, we've lost the idea of discipleship. We go to Sunday school and we train the kids, but when we leave here, we don't really train the kids to be the church. And when we come back to church, we let them go to Sunday school, but and the church doesn't have an active role in discipleship. How do I know? Well, if you start looking around at our different, and I'll just use ABA churches, Missionary Baptist churches. Most of them are small, and most of them are getting smaller. And I've had the experience, God has blessed me. I've had the experience to grow up in a church for 12 years in Landmark and Crasswood where I was taught the Bible in Sunday school and a, a man who I believe, uh, I hope received all the blessings the Lord will ever give him st stood so faithfully on Wednesday nights teaching us the best he could Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday trying to get us to learn the things of the Bible, of doctrine, of the importance. But I've seen that church get smaller and smaller. And when I was 12 years old, mom made the decision. Uh, well, I say mom. Mom and dad, but mom was the one that kind of hurt her heart. She wanted me and Devin to be around people and, and kids who were making decisions and being saved. Because I hadn't made a profession of faith. I was 12. I was under the conviction when I was 11. That's when I started. I knew I needed a savior, but I didn't know what to do. That's why it's important for parents and everybody to know. I didn't know who to ask. I didn't know who to go to. I just knew I was going to hell when I died. And so we left that church when I was 12 years old. We found Rayburn when I was going on 13. And so mom wanted to be in a church that had other kids, other kids being saved, other kids making decisions, other kids making decisions regarding Jesus and not just sitting and listening to a sermon. And so she, we left Landmark, who I think is it, down to a handful. They just called new pastor, maybe up to 15. I'm not positive. But we went to Rayburn, who is roughly, as you saw at my wedding, a big, large church. And so they, you know, probably are pushing 250 now. They're, they're a large church. Then I went to Interim at a church uh, in Mount. At that time, had three people. Now I believe they're in existence. I've had the opportunity to go down to Stuttgart, down to Hope, and preach in these churches. And I also have signed up for the ABA notifications on their websites. And so I get told of all the announcements. I get told of all the churches needing pastors. There's, pastor, there's churches in Colorado, and Michigan, and Arkansas, and Texas, Louisiana, all over the place. And I started looking through there, and every single church says we are a small congregation. Why? That's what I keep asking myself. Why are we a small congregation? Why has no one sounded the alarm that we are all getting smaller? And then we look here, and this is something I've been watching and I've been noticing, and the kids that we've been raising up through Sunday school are not here anymore. Why aren't they here, and why aren't we asking those questions? Because if we want to be a church in 30 years, add 30 years to your age and, and think what you, where you'll be. 
Will we have a church here if we aren't raising the younger men and the younger women to lead in the church? So many times in, in my life, what I have heard is that the older generation runs the church because they put in their dues, they pay the bills, and the younger generation, whenever they get there, then they can make the decisions. You know where the young went? The young went to other churches who valued them. They didn't quit church, and that's another thing I've heard. They just quit church, they just stopped. No, they didn't. They went to other churches, and they're building other churches. Guys, we have a problem. We have a big hole that our youth are just leaving, and I'm worried about Dalton, about Kara, about Isaac, about Bella, about Jace, because when they get here, are they going to stay here? Have we trained our kids to be the disciples that we need to hold down the fort? Have we made them sound doctrinally? Have we made them where they can call a pastor after 40 years? Do they know how a Lord's Supper looks? Have we trained them to be disciples in the church? Or have we just made church members? Because there's a difference. And I'm pouring my heart out to you because this is a problem. And no one sees it, I'm scared. We need to be making disciples. Not only of our kids and of our families, but of our friends and our community. I got here. And I thought it was amazing that we are a minute from Bauxite High School, a 4A, 5A school. We can be so impactful here. But here's the thing that we have to do. As individuals, we have to make the decision, I am not going to be a church member. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm not going to do what we've always done. I'm going to do what my Lord and Savior wants me to do, and that is win lost souls. Because that's the command he's given to this community of faith-based believers to be effective in discipleship, in salvation, in baptism, in ministry here in Bauxite. We have churches that are closing their doors, that are diminishing. I don't want us to look up in 20 years and say, what did we do? I got here and we were talking and I was told that the, the three main things we do in summers is VBS, church camp, and revival. And the next thing I heard was, well, back 10, 15 years ago, we were running 150 in Sunday school and we built the education building. It's dangerous and here's, here's, what, I wanna, here's what I want us to kind of think about. It's dangerous for us to look in the rear view and not look where we're going. Because a lot of churches, what happens is when they start looking at the past and thinking about the glory days and how good this church used to be, we start making a, a boundary about where we're going to go. And sometimes we get kind of diminished and we say, well, we're never going to be back there. We're never going to do that again. We, we will never be able. And we start limiting ourselves and limiting God. If you get in your car, and I would encourage you, don't drive off immediately when we dismiss here. Stay in your car and look in your rearview mirror. And think about trying to get where you're going by only looking in the rearview mirror. Now, unless you have a fancy, Angel Turner, a fancy car that has the, the GPS in the mirror, you're probably not going to get very far. You'll hit something, someone, fly off the road, hit the sign again. We don't know. And that's why they gave you a huge windshield and such a small rearview mirror. Because a lot of the stuff you don't need to see, unless they're chasing you with blue lights, is in your rearview mirror. The safest way to get to where you're going is looking through your windshield at where you're going. And in the church, the same way. Yes, we glory and we praise God for our past and what Brother Burris did here for 45 years, because that's unimaginable. And how we had 150 and how we built an education building. But guys, our church is fairly young. I think we're about 75, 76 years old. There are churches that have been around for 200, 300 years. We are a relatively young church. And if we start looking backwards and saying, wow, that was such an amazing time, we'll never be back there again, we're going to miss where God is wanting us to go because we're too busy looking in the rearview mirror. So this morning, I poured out my heart to you. I pray that together we can decide that we are going to be disciples not church members or not West Boxidians or whatever you want to call us, that we are Christ-like disciples. Gathered together in this community in which God has placed us all for a reason. You think you're here just by coincidence or because you like the preacher. I know that's not why. God wanted you here for a reason. And so that we can come together and we can evangelize Boxite, Arkansas. 
the school, the churches, the community. But in order for us to do that, we have to say, Lord, I will follow you when he calls us. And I think, church, he's called us. How are we going to respond? Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of our time together, Lord, we thank you so much for your opportunity to be here.